Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Professor Steve Davis's professorial uh, inaugural lecture. Uh, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to all our visitors and colleagues, and I'm very pleased to be introducing you to you today what I know will be a fascinating professorial lecture by Professor Steve Davis. Steve is a member of our engineering directorate and makes a significant contributions to research, knowledge transfer, innovation, and also to inspiring our students, whether they be undergraduate students, postgraduate taught or doctoral researchers. Steve's specific research innovation contribution is in soft robotics. And I suppose many of us have stereotypes what robotics are, and Steve's lecture will both, both be engaging us and inspiring us as we delve into that world of, of robotics. I'll leave Steve to explain, far better than me, the difference between hard and soft robotics for to all of us. Steve has a strong background in research from being a research fellow in robotics and automation here at Salford from 1999 to 2008, then leaving us to become a team leader at the Italian Institute of Technology, but happily returned to us at Salford in 2012. Steve also has a strong record of contributions to major research projects, he led the development of soft robotics hardware for the Salford Autonomous Systems and Advanced Robotics Research Centre, along with other colleagues, Still also, Steve has also won grant income totalling over four million pounds in funders such as the EU, Innovate UK and the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. Furthermore, Steve has authored a significant number of research papers outputs that in combination with Steve's additional achievements provide evidence of both national and international esteem. Steve also has two patents resulting from his research. During this time, Steve has contributed to both supporting and developing PhD students within his areas of expertise, first as a co-supervisor, and now with three PhD students having completed their PhD with Steve as their supervisor. All of those students were productive, publishing and working on research grants in parallel with their doctoral studies during the time of Steve's supervision. Steve's research students have thus received both excellent su support and an excellent experience that will, I'm sure, be underpinning their ongoing successes. Steve has been a PhD examiner on 10 occasions and has published in more than 70 national conference proceedings and journals, and has also both authored and co-authored book chapters. That wasn't enough, Steve has also contributed to over 40 confidential reports to companies on potential areas of automation. Steve's overall contribution and mark of esteem are also evident in contributions to inspiring students who are supervising both undergraduate and postgraduate projects, totally more than 60 in number. Finally, not content with inspiring the multi, multiple research groups and students locally and internationally, Steve also inspires beyond the academic industrial environments. Steve also contributes to local events, engaging children in the world of robotics, thereby inspiring the next generation and indeed further to all general public generations via radio, television and the written media. Media. At this point, it's my very great pleasure to introduce you to Professor Steve Davis. Steve, over to you. Thank you very much, Carl. Um, welcome everybody. Thank you for attending my uh, lecture today. Um, it's unfortunate we're not able to do this uh, face to face, but we'll uh, make the best of it. Um, before I begin uh, with the lecture proper, just a, a couple of notes to, uh, to mention beforehand. Uh, there will be the opportunity to ask some questions uh, at the end. So if you have any questions, if you put them in the, uh, the questions box uh, in Teams, uh, my colleague will answer, um, pass those to me at the end and I'll do my best to answer them, depending on how much time uh, we have left. Uh, also, the um, lecture is being recorded uh, and you'll get a link at the end uh, that will take you to that if you want to watch back or uh, I don't think you uh, require further information um, about. So I'd like to now begin with the, uh, the presentation that I've prepared, um, which hopefully you'll find interesting. It includes uh, some photographs and some videos of some of the projects that we're working on uh, and how that fits uh, within the sort of general background um, of robotics. So, as Carl mentioned, uh, I'm a member of the Autonomous Systems uh, and Advanced Robotics Research Centre um, here at, at Salford. And as you mentioned, I've um, been at Salford for uh, a long period of, uh, of time, um, initially as a student. Um, I work very closely with the, the lead of the, the research centre, Professor Samir Mefti Mesiani, who I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Uh, and together we've had uh, numerous grants and publications, uh, researchers and um, PhD students, um, as Carl has already mentioned. 
Now, my research covers a whole broad range of different um, areas from um, end effectors, which are uh, robot hands, uh, through rehabilitation robotics. Uh, I do work with industrial robots and I've done projects with uh, food manufacturers looking at uh, automating their manufacturing processes. Um, I've currently involved in a project on autonomous vehicles. But the two areas that I'm going to specialise in in my talk today are uh, what's known as biologically inspired robotics um, and, and soft robotics. Now, I'm conscious that I've got a fairly mixed audience today, so this um, presentation is not going to be particularly um, technical. So if you're expecting lots of equations, I'm afraid you're going to be a little disappointed, uh, but hopefully I'll give you some taster uh, of some of the projects uh, that we're, uh, we're involved, uh, involved in. If we um, ask some members of the public to, to think about robotics, uh, what they're likely to think of are things like you can see on the slides uh, here. People's um, opinions of, of robotics is very much influenced by what we see uh, in the movies, on TV and in, uh, in books. Uh, and depending on uh, what age you are, there's probably something here that uh, you, can, you can associate uh, with. So this is, this is what people, the general public, tend to think of when they think about robotics. And there is a lot of interesting work going on both uh, within our centre and, and all around the world in robotics at the moment. Um, but the reality is um, most robots look a little bit more like this. Um, the car manufacturing industry is still the biggest you know, user of, of robotics. And you can see on the right hand side there a photograph from inside a, um, a, a car manufacturing plant. A lot of these are uh, what are known as industrial robots. Um, very uh, well established technology started being developed in the late 60s and, and early 70s um, and I say the car industry is still the, the biggest user um, of industrial robots today. But we are starting to see robots being used in, in other applications, um, so in things like healthcare, uh, in the home, in entertainment um, and over the coming years we're going to start to see robots being used uh, in application areas that we might not even uh, have considered. Um, up to now. So, so the reality is, is very different uh, from what people think about when they think about robotics. But what I'm going to show you today, hopefully, is that things are changing uh, and we are moving away from this sort of design of robot uh, into things which are very, very different. Um, and specifically, I'm going to concentrate on this idea of robots that are uh, biologically inspired um, or, or soft. And we'll see a little bit more about what I mean by soft um, as we go through uh, this lecture. So as I've mentioned, robots are going to be used in uh, different application areas uh, in the future. Um, and that means they're probably going to come into close contact uh, with people. Now, just taking manufacturing as, a, as an example, we saw on the previous slide the robots being used uh, in, in car manufacturing. Uh, and there are lots of other manufacturing areas, so the food industry, um, just, just as just an example, uh, where automation and robotic use is relatively uh, relatively low still. Uh, and part of the reason for that is, is because there are uh, particular tasks that are very difficult to automate and are not suited to, to robotics. Uh, and that can mean actually automating those processes can be uh, very, very expensive or potentially impossible. Uh, and so what we tend to do is give, give those tasks uh, to people. Now, if we've got some of the tasks being performed by people and some being performed by robots, then obviously we've got people and robots working in the same um, the same area of the factory. Um, and that's got to be got to be safe. Um, robots are potentially very dangerous uh, machines. And if we've got people working close to them, uh, that needs to, to be that interaction needs to be safe. And that problem is going to be exacerbated as we see robots in other sectors, you know, robots going into the home uh, and what have you, where they're going to interact closely with people. And so it's essential that interaction um, is safe. Uh, and what I'm going to explore in this uh, in this lecture is actually designing robots which are inherently safe. So from the point where they're designed, they're actually designed in a way so that if they interact with people, they do that uh, in a safe way. What we also will be looking at uh, is new designs of robots that provide uh, greater dexterity, so are, are more flexible, uh, potentially are capable of doing things that traditional uh, industrial robots, like we've seen on the previous slide, uh, are not capable um, of achieving. So I say human robot safety is incredibly important, 
Uh, and the traditional approach that's used with robots is what you see uh, in these photographs here. Uh, the robot is kept away from people, uh, very often uh, physically separated by, by a metal cage to actually prevent people um, moving into the cell and, and getting it within a work volume, so within the reach uh, of the robot. And that ensures uh, safety, keeping people uh, and the robots um, apart. There are other approaches that have been developed to, to get away from these, these hard, rigid barriers, uh, things like light sensors and vision systems uh, and such like that will detect, detect people. Uh, so if a person enters the, the, the cell that the robot's in, uh, the control system will slow the robot down or potentially stop it uh, to, to prevent uh, an accident uh, from occurring. But obviously that completely destroys any possibility of collaboration between uh, a robot uh, and a person. Uh, and that collaboration, as I've already mentioned, is, is seen as part of uh, the, the future of industrial robots, particularly where people will work closely on a production line uh, alongside a robot, or as I've mentioned, where robots are used uh, in other scenarios where they're going to come into contact with people. So we need another approach uh, to safety than this um, this traditional approach of keeping people uh, and robots separate for one another. So these three photographs or, or, or um, graphical representations are just to, to show a vision um, that we're looking to achieve uh, in the future. So how in, uh, robots will interact uh, in a range of different scenarios here uh, with people. So. What we've got on the left hand side there is uh, a person working in um, aerospace assembly uh, and what he's got is these two uh, robots that are working very close to him uh, in a safe manner uh, alongside him to do some sort of assembly task. Um, similarly, another example, so this is in a, um, a, um, a warehouse with, uh, with trains in it and what they're doing there is inspecting uh, the trains and so what we have is people within the um, vicinity of the, the carriage here but we've also got the soft robots which have got sensors uh, and cameras and such like uh, mounted to them to, to help the people do that inspection task. And then the final scenario that we're looking at there is in, in nuclear decommissioning. So we've got a person in a, in a hot cell doing some sort of commissioning uh, but we've got a robot that's helping him do that. Uh, and in all three of these scenarios, we've got people very close to the robots. Uh, and so these robotic systems need to be uh, inherently safe so that they don't cause any injury uh, to the people uh, that are working alongside them. And the existing robots that we've seen up to now, the industrial robots are not suited to this. And so this is our vision of this new generation uh, of robots that allow for this safe uh, interaction with people. Now, if we just go back to this, um, the idea of the traditional uh, traditional industrial robots as seen on the left hand side here, and there are, there are robots made by a whole range of um, different manufacturers, but they're all broadly similar um, to what we see here. Uh, a very high weight, um, high inertia, metallic uh, robot um, that is incredibly advanced, very, very accurate, often very fast, um, but because of its nature, because it's a rigid metallic structure, uh, it's dangerous to work alongside people. But if we look at how people and animals interact with one another, we're not like the rigid robot there. Uh, biological systems are compliant, so that means they're, they're springy. Uh, our, our, our muscles and our tendons uh, are elastic, so actually we have this compliance built into us. So you can see that the picture, picture of the person uh, jumping there, the reason he's able to tolerate that impact as he lands is because of the springiness uh, in his muscles and in, in his tendons uh, will absorb that impact. And so what we're looking at is can we look towards biology and what biology does to create this, this safer interaction, but actually apply that into uh, robotic, uh, robotic systems. And so this is something that's been interesting the, the robotics community for, uh, for uh, many years now. This is some work that was done in uh, at Massachusetts Institute of Technology 15 or so um, years ago. And what they've done is they've taken a traditional uh, electric motor, which is one of the most common types of actuator that's used to drive robots, um, and which is typically stiff and leads to these rigid robots we've talked about. Um, but what they've done is then attached springs onto that. 
So you can possibly make out on the on the picture at the bottom there, uh, there's some, some blue springs. Uh, now, what that means is if someone was to push the end of the actuator there, it will it will give, it will be compliant against um, those springs. So instead of just using traditional motors within our robotic systems, if we use this new series elastic actuator, as it's called, that's got this springiness in it, then our robotic system suddenly becomes compliant. It has that springiness um, that we have within biological um, creatures. So that was the driver at MIT to actually develop um, this, this new actuator technology. Now, there are problems associated with, uh, with compliant systems. Um, and I put up here a couple of photographs to try and demonstrate um, the, the point I'm, I'm making. But we've got two different tasks that have been performed here, uh, and they, each of them are using um, different uh, different tools. So the guy on the left hand side uh, is picking apples and you can see he's got that bag on the end of a, a long uh, rigid pole um, and it allows him to position that next to the apple and knock the apple um, off into, into the bag. So that's a a rigid, a rigid system. On the right hand side though we've got the, the fisherman with his um, fishing uh, rod which is a flexible uh, material. You know, you've all seen um, you know, a fisherman pole flexes when it um, when, when you cast a line and when, when a fish is, is hanging on the end of it that the rod will, will deflect because it's a springy to compliant system. So now the reason I put these photographs up is because what I want you to try and do is imagine trying to pick the apples using the fishing rod. So the fishing rod will flex all over the place and actually getting that bag, if it was on the end of the fishing rod, aligned with the apple to allow you to pick it would be very, very difficult because of that flexibility uh, in the fishing rod. So although the compliance system has advantages in terms of it, it's safe or, or much safer because it's got that give in it, it's much more difficult to do precise uh, control and precise tasks with uh, a compliant system. Uh, and so there's been interest over the last 10 years or so um, in developing systems which have what's known as, as variable stiffness. It allows them to, to be compliant, so they can be, can be safe, they can store mechanical energy in, in, in the springs, for example. But when we want to do very precise motions, they can increase that stiffness, they can become much more rigid to do the precise position. So it kind of overcomes the problem hopefully I've described in the uh, in, in the previous slide. slide. So there's a lot of in, been a lot of interest in developing these variable, variable stiffness uh, actuators, which when applied to a robotic system, allows the robot to operate in a, a compliant manner or in a, in a more rigid manner, uh, depending on the application uh, that it's been, been used for. Now, a lot of the work I've been doing um, since um, since my PhD has been on pneumatic muscles, which um, you might not be uh, familiar with, but are an actuator which is uh, is being being seen used in uh, in robotics, uh, and it's an actuator which is inherently compliant. So by that it means it has this springiness in it um, by by the very nature of the way uh, it works. Um, and you can see a photograph at the bottom here of one of these these actuators, uh, and what happens when it's filled with air? It will contract and it contracts by about 35%. Uh, and as it contracts, it creates a force. Um, it's got the it's got the compliance, as I've already mentioned, because it's full, full of air. Uh, if we were to then pull on that actuator, the, the air compresses and it acts a little bit like a uh, little bit like a spring, a spring. Um, and the actuator only produces force in one direction, it only produces um, a contractile force. And so very broadly, it behaves uh, in, a, in a manner which is not dissimilar to that uh, of organic organic muscle. Uh, and so we've been developing these um, these actuators for uh, a number of years. I say I did a lot of work in my PhD uh, on advancing uh, these actuators, changing the way they were formed, uh, and, and applying them to, to applicate other application areas. Uh, and these, these actuators form the basis of, of much of what I'm going to tell you about um, over the rest of this, um, this presentation. Now, as I mentioned, the actuators only produce um, a contractile force, just like organic muscle. Uh, they, only, they only produce uh, a pull, they only produce a, a, tensile, a tensile force. 
Now, if we want to, to drive a, a joint of a robot in, in, in two directions, then what we have to do is use uh, what's known as antagonistic muscles, and that's what's being shown uh, in the diagram here. So we've got a, a representation of a very simple uh, joint, uh, a lever, uh, and it's attached to, to two muscles uh, via a tendon. And what you can see is that the bottom muscle has contracted, the top muscle has extended, and the, uh, the joint has moved. And if you want to move the joint in the opposite direction, then obviously we relax the contracted muscle uh, and uh, contract uh, the one that's currently extended, uh, and the joint will move uh, in the opposite direction. Uh, and this is exactly the same setup we have if we look at, a, uh, look at ourselves. So if you look at your, your upper arm, you've got muscles on both the front uh, and the rear of your arm, which are used uh, to power the elbow. So this antagonistic uh, operation is common within biology. What this also allows us to do is control this stiffness that I've talked about, because what we can do is actually activate both muscles uh, at the same time. Uh, and although we won't cause a change in position of the joint, we suddenly make the joint uh, a lot stiffer. Just like if we tense our muscles, we can make um, our elbow joint much more rigid, much stiffer, but if our muscles are relaxed, then it becomes more, more compliant and more, uh, more spring-like. So we have this uh, variable stiffness ability within these actuators um, that we, that we are, um, are using. And I've mentioned my, my PhD already, and I said that this, this work stemmed from that. So this is, this is very old technology now, you know, 20 years old, um, but I'm showing this because this is the sort of the, the starting point for a lot of the work um, that I'm going to um, talk about going forward. Um, so this is uh, what we know as a, a biomimetic robot. Um, possibly haven't heard of the term biomimetics, but what biomimetics is, is all about is, is, is stealing good ideas from nature. So actually looking at how nature solves problems uh, and then copying it or using it to inspire us to create uh, engineering um, solutions. Uh, and so what we're seeing here is a, a robot that we developed um, based on, on a gorilla. So if you compare the two uh, photographs here, you can see the, the skeleton of the gorilla uh, and then the plastic skeleton of the robot, which is kind of broadly uh, a similar kind of anatomy. Uh, and then attached to that are the pairs of antagonic stick uh, muscles that I talked about to, to power uh, the robot. So this robot was done, uh, was produced as part of a, um, a, a publicity scheme. It was about encouraging children into engineering by making it look, um, or showing how exciting and interesting it can be um, by developing a robot. And we had children uh, program the robot uh, to beat its chest and what, what have you. Um, but I'm showing this because it's where a lot of the work um, going forward stems from. But if you look at this robot, it's still a rigid system. The skeleton uh, is still rigid. Yes, the actuators and the joints are compliant, uh, but the skeleton of the system uh, is still um, solid uh, plastic uh, material. Now, I mentioned that it's the, uh, the air in the actuators that makes them um, compliant. Air is, is compressible. Um, if we think about our, uh, the tyres on, on our car, uh, they're pumped up with, with air, uh, but we can actually squeeze the tyre. What we're doing is compressing uh, the air that's within, uh, within the tyre. And these actuators work in exactly the same way. The air that's inside them, when we try to, to extend the muscle, what we're doing is we're compressing that air uh, and it's acting like a, uh, like a spring, in exactly the same way uh, that the air in your tyre compresses as you're going over bumps uh, in the road. Now, one of the questions we had would be, well, what would happen if we replace that compressible gas with a with a liquid? Um, and so what we've done is uh, instead of filling the actuators with, with, uh, with air, we filled them with water, which is um, a mostly uh, incompressible um, fluid. Now, the actuators, it doesn't matter to the actuators whether that fluid is a liquid or a gas, they'll still work uh, in exactly the same way. Um, but the thinking was if we put water into them, then we're reducing that amount of compliance. Uh, and so the graph that's shown here is actually showing uh, the actuators being used with a mixture of both gas, uh, air uh, and water. Uh, and what you can see on the left hand side of the gra graph there, where there's um, or it completely filled with air with no water, the system is, is compliant, its stiffness is relatively low. But as we increase the ratio of water relative to, uh, to air, then the system becomes stiffer up to the point where uh, the stream right there 
uh, there's no air in the system, it's just water. The system has become um, much more rigid. So we've got the same, same actuator, the same muscle, but we're able to operate it in two, um, two modes. A compliant mode where it's using air to power it uh, and a hydraulic mode where it's using, using water. Now, that's all fine and well. You've got two, two systems using the same technology, but what would be nice is actually to be able to switch between the two. Uh, and we've developed some, some work here that um, Sharon and, and Elena worked on, two researchers who were working with us, who've developed a system, or we developed a system that allows the system to um, rapidly switch between those uh, two modes. So I'll just play this video again. What it's initially doing here is working in the pneumatic mode. And so as we apply a force to it, it gives, it has that compliance, but then it can very rapidly switch to a hydraulic mode, which you'll see uh, in a moment. And then when we apply a force to it, suddenly the system has become much more rigid. You can see it's flexing, uh, flexing less. So we've now got a, a joint which is able to work in this compliant mode, but also switch to uh, a rigid mode if we want to do these more precise uh, types of motion and precise action um, that I've talked about. Now, the robotics industry is, um, is obviously recognising that robots are going to be used in um, other applications other than just car manufacturing uh, going forward and so they're looking at the design uh, of robots to try and make them uh, safer to work alongside uh, people. Uh, and this has led to the development of a whole new family of robots, which are known um, as cobots, uh, because the idea is they'll uh, collaborate uh, with, with people. Uh, and the whole idea with these robots is that they can work closely uh, alongside people. Um, and the way they do that is by changing the design of the robot so that they're much lighter than traditional robots. So if the robot collides with a person, there's a lot less uh, mechanical energy uh, in that collision, so it's less likely to cause, cause serious injury. One of the downsides of that is if the, the robot is lighter, it tends to be less powerful, and so the payload that it can carry um, is reduced. Also, some of the, the cobots that have been produced have also included some compliance in them. Um, so some of the, the systems that I showed um, uh, five or ten minutes ago um, have been incorporated into some of these cobots so that they can, they can switch to this compliant mode. But if you look at the, uh, the photographs here and the photograph from uh, a factory, a Unilever factory, just looking at the robot, you can still see, although it might be lightweight, it's still made of these rigid um, metallic and plastic uh, structures which, if they collide with a person, are still potentially going to cause uh, cause injury. There's been quite a lot of work. Um, this is some, some work from from Germany, from uh, from DR, the DR, um, looking at uh, robots and what happens when they uh, collide with people, and actually trying to make them uh, them safer. Uh, and what they're doing here is actually looking. Uh, at the control systems and sensing technology uh, to detect collisions and to actually minimise um, the impacts and minimise the, uh, the dangers. So you can see at the top right there where the robot is, uh, is colliding with a person, it's fitted with a, a sensor which detects uh, the force very, very rapidly and very precisely. And what the robot's able to do is in an incredibly short period of time, detect that collision uh, and effectively cause the robot to go to go limp, to go compliant, so it doesn't cause injury um, to the person. Um, and the, the photographs on the on the bottom there, uh, on the left hand side, what, what the robot's holding is a, a, a sharp knife. Uh, and what it's done is program it to, uh, to basically try and insert down into the into the cut of meat. Uh, and the force sensing is so accurate, it's able to detect that contact and stop the robot before the knife actually penetrates. Um, uh, the meat. Uh, and DLR have actually demonstrated this at exhibitions, as you can see on the right hand side, um, which is quite terrifying, um, but they're actually proving that the, the system will uh, cause the robot to, uh, to stop before it injures uh, the person. The emergency stop button in the guy's hand seems a bit optimistic to me, um, but the technology has, uh, has been, uh, been, been proven. Now we're going to be looking a totally different way of addressing um, that problem. Um, so if we go back to, to biology, 
we look at some of the creatures. Not all creatures have these rigid skeletons um, that we've uh, that we've I've been talking about up to now. Um, we've got octopus. We've got the elephant's trunk, caterpillars, um, various other other sea life. These creatures don't have a rigid um, skeleton, yet they're able to perform, you know, able to move, they're able to manipulate objects and potentially do a uh, very complex uh, task, task. Now, what soft robotics is all about is actually looking at what these creatures do and taking inspiration from these animals and these creatures uh, and developing uh, robotic, robotic systems that in a similar way don't have um, rigid skeletons. And these are just a few soft robot, uh, robotic systems that have been developed around the world. So on the right hand side there, there's uh, a soft robot based on the octopus. Uh, on the left hand side, uh, one on a worm. Um, the, the middle top there is, is from Harvard uh, and the bottom one based on a, on a caterpillar. So it's all about mimicking um, the, the creatures that we see uh, that we've talked about, which don't have um, skeletons. Now, if you think about the creatures that I've talked about, on the whole, they're, they're either very small um, or they live uh, underwater. Uh, and the reason for that is because without a skeleton, it's very difficult to actually support uh, a heavy weight. So smaller animals obviously don't have as much weight to support. And if you're, if you're in water, then the buoyancy uh, that the water provides takes some of that um, weight away from the, from the limbs. And so what that means is a lot of the soft robots that have been um, developed have been, been small for the same reason. Uh, and what we're looking at doing um, is, is producing systems which are, uh, are larger and uh, potentially more useful in robotic application. So what you're seeing in this video is one of the first um, continuum arms that we produced, um, which is based on, a, on an elephant's trunk. Um, you can see it's very different from a traditional robot arm. It doesn't have um, a wrist joint or an elbow joint or um, a shoulder, for example. But instead, the whole system flexes in the same sort of way that an elephant's trunk um, flexes. So depending on how we pressurise it, um, there's different chambers within, within it. Depending on how we pressurise that, we can create very different motions. So you could see um, the robot moving from side to side, but also able to track uh, a circle in this instance by pressurising the chambers uh, in, a, in particular, uh, particular ways, um, depending on how we power it. So this was our first uh, demonstrator of this, this technology. Uh, and what we've done is gone on and actually developed that into um, a, a soft continuum arm. So this was some work that was carried out um, by our researchers, um, Elena and Sharon, who were working with us at the time, taking that same technology from the previous slide, but actually developing it into a, a more useful robotic system. So there's a number of advantages to this system. It's, it's very lightweight. There's probably 500 pounds worth of material um, in the system compared to a traditional robot, which um, we would be talking uh, many thousands of pounds. Um, there are no rigid links. Um, the whole arm flexes, as I've mentioned already. Um, it's, it's lightweight, um, yet it's powerful. So this system weighs roughly uh, a kilogram um, but it can pick up and move around uh, an object that might weigh uh, five kilos. And that makes it very different than the traditional robots that we saw at the start, where a, pay, uh, a robot with a payload of five kilograms could, could easily weigh 40, 50, um, 60 kilos. So it has a very high uh, power to weight uh, ratio. And it's also uh, able to operate safely alongside uh, people. If you walk up to this robot and you push it, it will give it compliant. Uh, it, it, um, it will move away from you in the same way that um, a, a, an animal, uh, an animal might. What it's also able to do that makes it different in traditional robot arms is actually uh, operate when partially constrained. So what I mean by that is we could actually clamp some of this, hold some of the robot, um, and it would move elsewhere. Um, at a different location along its uh, along its length. So this means we can insert it into a pipe, let's say, uh, and it will naturally adapt to the shape of the pipe. Or if it comes into contact with, a, with a, an obstacle, uh, it will naturally deform and shape um, around that object. So not only is it safe, it actually potentially has applications uh, in sectors where traditional robots um, can't, be, uh, can't be used. 
And one of the other challenges uh, in, in robotics is in terms of uh, in terms of grasping. Uh, and the, uh, the photographs around the outside here uh, are showing some of the typical uh, industrial robots. So the sort of typical things that you see mounted to the end uh, of a robot in a manufacturing uh, plant, let's say, for picking up objects, um, you know, assembling cars, placing them into, into parts into machines, uh, what have you. Now they're all relatively simplistic uh, and they all are typically only suited to um, a single or a small range of individual products. Uh, and the video that was playing up there was a, a gripper for, um, for the food industry for grasping tomatoes and cucumbers. It's great at grasping those objects, um, but it's again, it's limited to what it can, can do. Um, and so there's a drive to developing what's known as dexterous grippers or grippers that are um, have a much broader um, broader range of ability. Uh, and the human hand is a good example of that. And so the video uh, I showed here was some work uh, I did while I worked at the Talent Institute uh, of Technology, developing a human-like uh, hand, a hand that has you know, torn to the human, uh, a bit like a human hand, which allows it to do multiple tasks with this, this single um, tool. Now, there are a number of drawbacks to these dexterous end effectors, these human-like hands. First of all, they're incredibly expensive to develop. Um, but they also lack robustness. So that system is, that I showed is a very interesting piece of science, um, but if we put it into a factory, it wouldn't last a long period of time because it doesn't have that mechanical robustness um, that um, a system needs when it's working in the industry. Also, it's incredibly difficult uh, to control. Now, the photograph here is of uh, Jimmy Anderson, um, local boy and very successful cricketer, uh, taking uh, an amazing catch. And the reason I've put this up here is because I'm thinking, well, how does Jimmy Anderson know where to put all his fingers to catch the ball like that? How does he know all the joint angles, what they need to be to catch the ball in a fraction of a second? Well, the truth is he doesn't. Um, we don't have the, the brain power, the cognitive ability to do that. And what we do instead is actually we move our hands uh, in patterns of motion uh, known, as, known as primitives or, or synergies. And you can see this if you actually watch your hands as you're, as you're grasping objects. You tend to use the same motions over and over again for a range of different um, objects. So this leads us to develop, has led us to developing um, grippers that don't look like the human hands, don't behave like the human hand, uh, but actually are able to grasp objects um, in the same way that a human hand does, so having that, um, that, that adaptability. Uh, and so what we're seeing here is uh, a gripper which has got, got three fingers. Uh, the fingers are a little bit like the elephant's trunk that I showed you uh, previously, um, and you can see they deform. So when, we, when the ball is placed between the fingers, you can see the fingers start to wrap around um, the object. Uh, that compliance in them allows them to naturally adapt to the shape of the object uh, that they're grasping. So there's a number of benefits here. The, the gripper doesn't need to know what it's grasping. It doesn't need to be pre-programmed for every object. It will kind of naturally uh, adapt to the, to the shape of, uh, of the object. Um, what it's also able to do is it maximizes the, uh, the grasp area because it's wrapping around the object. We haven't got localized areas of, of high force on the object. The grasp is spread over a bigger area. So if we were grasping something like an egg, for example, that grasp force is spread over the surface of the egg, less likely to cause, uh, cause damage. This is another uh, example uh, of, a, of a similar gripper developed by uh, Loai, who's one of, our, uh, one of our PhD students. Um, this is a little bit more like how a human um, arm operates. So on the top right hand side, you can see uh, a, um, a CAD model of the, of the system. So we've got three fingers, but in the forearm, we've got we've got muscles which actually apply forces onto the fingers um, using a series uh, of tendons. So you can see the tendons moving in the video uh, and pulling the fingers in various directions. Now the fingers themselves are actually a little bit like balloons, which are inflated. Um, so they will, they will deform as the te uh, tendons tend to pull them uh, and they will wrap around objects as you can see uh, on the right hand side um, there. What we're also able to do with this, and what Loi was able to prove, uh, is we can change the stiffness uh, of, the, of the fingers. So if we, if we pressurise the fingers, if we increase the pressure in the fingers, they become more rigid, they become more stiff. So we can have the fingers in a very soft, flexible, compliant way uh, mode or in a much stiffer mode. Uh, and that means we can use the same gripper to graph a whole range of different products. And you can see this on the right hand side here. There's what nine different objects that are being grasped there. The gripper doesn't know anything about 
what any of them are, but because of that flexibility in the fingers, what they'll do is naturally adapt to the shape of the object and create a, um, a grasp. So we don't have to have complex control systems uh, and lots of pre-programming and pre-thought to actually pick up these objects. The gripper, the way it works inherently within it, it will adapt to the object uh, and produce uh, a suitable grasp. And again, the technology here is um, very low cost. Now, I mentioned initially that these muscles that we've been working on produce uh, contractile motion. So in the video on the left, you can see uh, how the muscle uh, works traditionally. Um, but work that we've been doing with uh, both Ala uh, and Hassanin, some of our PhD students, uh, have looked at actually changing the way that the muscles work. So the second video there is actually what we call an extensor muscle. Its power stroke is actually when it extends. So it's, it's working in the opposite way to a traditional muscle, muscle it, it produces a, effectively a push instead of a, instead of a pull. And then the two on the right hand side, what we've done is actually taken that a stage further and actually started to constrain some areas uh, of the actuator. Um, so what's happening is you can probably make out the, the white thread. What that's doing is preventing that side of the muscle from extending. When the other side extends, when it's pressurized, it creates this bending motion. So we've now got actuators not only contract, but we've got versions which extend uh, and, uh, and bend uh, as well. And over the next few slides, you'll see applications uh, of these other um, types of actuator that we've, we've been developing. So this is a, um, an, another type of muscle. So on the, on the left hand side, you can see the muscles around the, uh, the eye. So all muscles aren't actually necessarily straight. We have some uh, muscles which are, uh, are circular. Uh, and so this is some work that I say Ala, one of our PhD students did on producing um, a, a circular or ring shaped um, muscle. Um, now what happens when this is activated is it, it contracts and it actually reduces in diameter. So if the ring is placed around an object, it will tighten around it. So in the video that was playing on the right hand side there, there's a series of these um, these ring shaped muscles which wrap around that post when they're activated they tighten around it allowing it to be grasped and again this is a technology that could be applied to lots of different objects you can looking at the photograph there you can probably imagine how this would grasp a, um, a bottle of wine for example the top ring would contract to a different degree uh, and tighten around the neck where it's narrower uh, than it is at the bottom, uh, for example. So again, the gripper will uh, automatically conform to the object that it's being required uh, to grasp. Now, you're probably familiar with exoskeletons, um, either from because you're from a robotics background or you've seen them uh, in, in Hollywood movies and such like. Uh, and depending on on your age, you'll probably recognise one of the two photographs I've taken here from uh, from Hollywood. So the top photograph is from uh, from the film Aliens, uh, and Sigourney Weaver here is wearing uh, an exoskeleton system. And that, you can think of an exoskeleton as essentially a robot that somebody wears or that person is strapped to. Um, so what she's able to do is use this system to pick up um, objects that would be far too heavy for her to uh, to grasp. Um, without the system. Uh, and then the Iron Man suit is a similar sort of thing. The Iron Man suit makes, uh, makes uh, the, the, the guy stronger than he is just using his, his actual muscles. Uh, and so we're actually developing uh, exoskeleton uh, systems as well. Uh, they've been developed around the world, uh, but we're developing exoskeleton systems based on the soft robotics uh, work that I've been, uh, been talking about. Um, and the traditional approach to an exoskeleton is a little bit like a traditional robot. You have a, uh, a robot with individual joints and that robot effectively is strapped to the person. Um, and that means it has to be either designed or set up specifically for uh, an individual user. But using this soft robotics work we're doing, we can produce systems that actually don't need that setup and also have another range of uh, benefits as well. So the muscles that you can see on the back of the glove here are these bending muscles that I talked about. Uh, and what Hassan is doing here is using those muscles to bend uh, his fingers. So as they're actuated, as they're pressurized, they bend. And what they're doing is applying a force to the back of his fingers and they'll cause his fingers to flex at their, uh, at their joints. So 
there's no need to adjust this for a, uh, for a different sized hand. Uh, the system will work on a whole range of different uh, people's uh, people's uh, anatomy. So obviously everybody's hand sizes are slightly different. Um, the system will work irrespective of that. The system is also uh, very lightweight. Uh, this weighs you know, 100 grams or so. Uh, and again, it's, it's low cost um, technology. Uh, and we're involved in a, a project at the moment, an EFSRC project, where we're looking at um, seeing if we can apply the same sort of technology to, to astronauts gloves, so future astronauts um, uh, may use technology similar to this in their spacesuits to actually give them uh, either additional strength or to overcome some of the challenges that they have um, operating within a, a pressurised um, pressurized suit. There are also potential applications to this technology uh, in healthcare. Um, so we've, we've talked about uh, potentially using this in things like phys uh, physiotherapy and rehabilitation. So in the, in the simplest form, uh, what the system can do is actually manipulate a, a person's hand through a, a, a range of motions. So the, the user interface uh, on the bottom, so on the right hand side there, so it's a series of exercises and when they're selected, the glove will actually move the hand into those uh, positions. What's been demonstrated in the video though is actually using uh, a healthy hand to power or control uh, potentially an injured hand. So you can see that, that the healthy hand as it moves um, instructs the glove to actually move the uh, potentially the injured hand uh, in, the, in the same in the same way. Um, so we can we can use this for um, using allowing somebody to actually use their other hand or another limb to control the motion of their hands, or potentially for a a remote therapist to actually manipulate a person's, a person's hand. So potentially you can have physiotherapy, but done via the internet, for example, where a therapist would be using the top glove uh, and the patient would be wearing the, uh, the glove on the bottom. The system there um, provided motion to the, uh, the whole of the fingers. Um, but Hassanin has produced some, um, some more papers, uh, some more research, which we've We've published in some high impact journals, uh, impact factor journals, uh, to actually take the system a bit more advanced, so actually allow it to control uh, individual joints. So instead of flexing all of the joints of the hand at the same time or on a single finger, we can control uh, the joints more, uh, more individually. <clears throat> and I say this is all work that's been published. Everything that we've uh, shown today, there's been a series of, um, of paper, paper references, uh, which you'll be able to look back on uh, at the end if you're interested. Now, what this graph is showing is actually how effective the, uh, the system actually is. Um, so what we're showing here is the electrical activity within the person that's using the gloves muscles. So when we when we grasp an object, there is an electrical activity within, within our muscles. And depending on how much muscle effort we're using, that electrical uh, activity uh, is higher. And what the two graphs here are showing is grasping a two kilo object both when wearing the glove and without wearing the glove. Uh, and what you can see is a lot less effort is needed um, by the person's own muscles uh, when they're not wearing the glove, sorry, when they're wearing the glove than without it. So this potentially means somebody could use this system, um, do a task for long periods of time uh, without getting fatigued or without getting as fatigued because the robot is actually doing some of the, uh, the work for them or a large portion of the work, portion of the work for them. We also developed systems for other parts of the body. So this is a system that has been developed for, um, for, for the wrist. Um, the, uh, all the actuators are on the back of the hand here, so allowing the, uh, the hand, the, the front of the hand, the palm, uh, free to actually grasp objects. But the power from the wrist is actually being augmented by uh, the actuators. Uh, and similarly, we produced a, uh, a system for the elbow. So you can see here, that the actuators on the side of his elbow uh, and when they're uh, when they're powered uh, they cause the elbow um, to bend. Various ways that we, we demonstrated this but one one method was actually using um, the, the healthy arm so in this instance um, Hassan's left arm to drive the right arm so as he as he moves his left arm uh, a sensor detects how much uh, the joint has, has moved uh, and then the actuators power the other arm and move it um, to, to a similar uh, location. So effectively using the healthy arm to drive uh, a potentially uh, injured, uh, injured arm. 
And then just to, to finish off another potential application. So this was a, a demonstration we did for, uh, for a hospital to, just to show some of the potential uh, of soft robotics uh, in a hospital application. Uh, and what we're doing here is showing how a soft robot could be alongside a person uh, in, a, in, let's say, in a hospital um, to provide uh, feel, feeding or nutrition um, or to, to provide some sort of help uh, to a person. Uh, and to allow this system to, to exist, the robot has to be safe. It has to be one of these systems that can operate closely alongside a person without potentially causing um, any injury to them. So that comes to the end of the presentation now. Um, thank you for listening. I hope I've said some things that um, you found interesting that have inspired, inspired some ideas. Um, we've now got some time for some, some questions, which I'll do my best to answer. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good questions so far. Um, so the first question that I've got for you, Steve, is in the future, do you think we will all have robots in our homes? Um, well, I suppose the answer to that is depends what you mean by robots. Um, the, there are many definitions of robot. Um, a lot of them contradict one another. Um, a lot of them co cover things that we wouldn't necessarily think of um, as robots. Uh, and also there's a lot of variation across the world uh, as to what people think of as, as a robot. Um, I mean, in J Japan, for example, some, some kitchen appliances um, are thought of as robots and they do fit some of the definitions um, of, of what a robot is. And we're, we're, supposed, we're, we're starting to see robotic technology in our homes already. The, the Amazon Alexa and similar systems, for example, have a lot of the um, the characteristics and properties that we think about when we think uh, about a robotic uh, robotic system. If the question is, do I think we're going to see two-legged humanoid robots in everybody's home? The answer is probably not anytime soon. Great, thank you. Um, the second question, will robots take people's jobs? Um, it's Certainly robots are, are changing how people work and tasks which people have been doing, um, the manual tasks that people have been doing are certainly being uh, replaced by robots. So robots will definitely change uh, the way we work. Um, and there are there are fears that robots will cause to uh, will lead to um, you know, large numbers of unemployed people, uh, people losing their jobs. There's been numerous studies that have looked at this, and I think the sort of general conclusion seems to be, as with most technology that's been developed, uh, robotics will change the jobs we do. It won't make us um, lose our jobs. Um, and you think about other technology. I mean, the Internet, for example, think of the, the, the way the world works now, the jobs that we have now that didn't exist uh, before the Internet or the development of the personal computer, the word processor, um, even thinking back much more, more long longer ago to the development of the automobile. I mean, that would be the end of, uh, of horses and stable yards and what have you. But people have changed what they're doing. So there will definitely be, be changes. There will definitely be challenge, challenges ahead. Um, but I don't think that, um, there's a real serious issue of people, uh, of people being out of jobs because of robots. It's just going to change what we do and hopefully for the better. Great. Um, got another question from Praveen. Um, is there a marketplace to purchase soft robots? Um, there are a few soft robotic systems that are um, that are available. I think Harvard sell a version of their, theirs, uh, a, a gripper, a soft gripper that they've developed. Um, but soft robotics is is still a relatively new field um, of, of robotics. Um, as you can see, it's something that we uh, that I've been working on for, for 20 years, um, but it's only within the last six, seven years or so that it's really become a big thing. So it's still a technology that's fairly, uh, fairly young. So there will be some soft robotic systems that can be bought, uh, but it's certainly not a technology that at the moment is, uh, is, is widely on the market. Yeah, and while we're on the talking about soft ro um, robots, I've um, got another question from Roy um, who asked, might we see stuff, soft robots able to use hard tools? So say that again, Gemma. Might we see soft robots able to use hard tools? Yes, um, you're absolutely right. Um, I mean, the, the, the pictures that I showed you, for example, of the, the robot doing inspection had got a camera uh, on the end of it. Uh, and then there are obviously challenges there. 
um, because we now have a, a hard object, a hard rigid object, which is, is moving around. Uh, and so we have to start to use the soft robotic technology in a combination with these other things that I've talked about. So you know, supervisory systems to, to, to monitor what's going on in a cell uh, and control systems to, uh, to avoid um, unsafe situations uh, occurring. So yes, we will see um, Software, or we can see soft robotics using both rigid and uh, soft tools uh, uh, as well. Yes. Okay. And what are the barriers to implementing um, the robots in real health and healthcare? Um, is it the size of the robots or the re reliability or the maintenance of them? Um, it, it shouldn't be any of those things. It's, um, it's, it's a matter of the I suppose it comes it comes down to money. It's it's the taking the technology from the stage where it's um, it, it's being developed in labs and actually taking that to the point where it's clinically proven uh, and there are uh, customers for it. There are some examples within surgery, for example, where um, robotics is is being used. There are uh, other application areas where robotics or robotic like technology um, is is being used. Um, but it is it is something that we're going we're going to see more and more of uh, as the technology becomes cheaper, um, uh, more well proven. Then we'll certainly see uh, more of that. I think. Okay, we've got a question here um, from Payush, who says, "How can AI change and shape the future of robotics?" Blimey, I mean, that's a that's a tricky one. Um, in all sorts of ways that we can't even think of. Um, at, at the moment. Um, I mean, if you think about, um, I think it's 20 years ago before the internet really, uh, really existed. Um, and if you told people then what we use the internet for now, people would probably never have believed you. So I can see things that robotics is used, being used for at the moment, that robotics is being used for in the short term future. But to be honest, who knows in, in 10 years time, people will be using AI and robotics in systems and in problems that we've never even thought of, but problems that we didn't even know uh, were there. So it's something we're going to see more of uh, and in a whole range of, of applications, I say, that we might not even consider yet. And also regarding um, AI, um, can it help in robotics being safe for humans and how does it do this? Um, Yes, so we were involved in a, um, a European project um, which was, was looking, I've not talked about, but was actually looking at um, how traditional robots can work in a, in a more safe uh, a safe way with people. Uh, and so what it was doing was actually looking at how people are moving within the environment um, and actually, and, and how the robot was moving in the environment, uh, and then trying to anticipate uh, dangerous uh, events from occurring. So actually looking at how a person is moving and then using AI and, uh, and similar technique to actually predict how that person might move a second into the future. So to predict a, uh, a potentially dangerous scenario before it's occurring. So that sort of AI um, technology can be used absolutely as, as part, of, uh, part of safety. That's fascinating. Um, so this is the last question for you, Steve. Um, what are the main limitations of soft robotics? Um, well, there are there are various uh, various challenges um, that still exist. Um, control is one of them. Um, a traditional a traditional robot is relatively easy to control. You know, a robot that has a fixed number of joints and um, a fixed sort of ways it can it, it can can bend um, is relatively easy to control. Um, a soft robot, as you've seen, is, is more flexible, deformable. It becomes more difficult to, to control. Um, there are challenges in terms of uh, materials that you know, the new smart materials. Uh, traditional sensors that we use uh, with traditional robots don't necessarily directly apply to soft robots. So can we develop um, sensors that are more like a skin, for example, that would fit onto a soft robot that would allow it to, uh, to detect its environment? So there are, there are lots of challenges still to come uh, in soft robotics in terms of the, um, the, the actuators, uh, the sensors, the control, um, uh, and, um, and things like AI also has, has a place to play. Uh, as well. OK, that finishes the Q&A session. Um, just leave me. Thank you very much uh, for your attendance. I, I hope that you found uh, this interesting. Um, I said the system was uh, the, the session was being recorded, uh, so I believe you'll be sent a link 
um, to that uh, at the end. But again, thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoyed it uh, and good afternoon.